Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of the Field and Garden Podcast. It is your friend, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and I am just, you know, pretty thrilled that you decided to drop in and take a little listen, because I know you have lots and lots of choices. And um, so if we've never met before, welcome aboard. Um, You can learn more about the Gardener's Workshop and all the work that we're doing over at thegardenersworkshop.com that is packed with resources, our online garden shop, um, our online courses, just you kind of fall in over there and we just invite you um, to be there. And so today I am just really thrilled to have my guest here today, Greg Peterson of the Urban Farm Podcast. Hi, Greg. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. We, um, I think you've been on my podcast a couple of times and done yes. a class for us. So yes. I'm thrilled and- to be here. Yes. So that I was going to say, that's how we met. And I've been on there twice and I'm not, I know one of them was about vegetables, love flowers. Mm -hmm. And I think probably the other one was cool flowers, maybe my two books. So anyway, I just found this guy to be a pretty interesting character. So I thought we would have him over here on the field and garden because I mean, first off, the name of his podcast is the urban farm. Well, y'all know that I'm like right smack dab in the middle of the city and I'm more in the city now than I ever was before as, you know, the farm next to me was lost. And so Greg's um, podcast really covers a lot of great topics. And I mean, obviously I was over there, right, Greg? Right, exactly. (laughs) So I really feel like your podcast really applies and we're going to get into, you know, what, what you started as and where you are now. And there's so much exciting stuff going on. But Looking through your titles of just a bazillion different podcast titles, there's just so much that applies, whether you're a farmer, a wannabe farmer, or even a home gardener that can apply a lot, or even chicken keepers. Yep. Um, I saw that my friend Lisa Steele was with yep. you recently. Lisa literally used to just live about if, as the crow flies, um, not very far from me, like 20 minutes. But when you have to drive around the river, it takes a little longer before she moved up to Maine. This is where uh, they lived for a long time. So she and I connected just years ago. But um, anyway, friends, I just want to jump into this conversation because I feel like, Greg, that your podcast is really a catalyst of helping people to reconnect with growing food, growing their own food, maybe growing food to sell. Um, And so I just want to start at the beginning for you. And first off, I want you, we'll get to how people can connect to you and all of that at the end. I want to know how you got started gardening. Wow. Well, that's a, that's a long time question. Uh, I, in the eighth grade, I wrote a paper on how we were overfishing the oceans, and that was back in 1974. Wow. So I knew back then that there was something really inherently wrong with the way that we were living and eating on the planet. And I set out back then, at, you know, as a mid-teenager, to do something about it. Uh, my first business in Phoenix, Arizona, I used to clean, service, and build fish ponds, and I was particularly interested in aquaculture raising fish for people to eat. And around that same time, so I ran a business from the time I was 15 to the time I was 24, helping people with fish ponds and aquaponics setups. But during that same time, we moved into the Weldon house. It's a house that I grew up in. And mom said, see the right half of our backyard? That's your garden, go start digging. (laughs) So I don't really know how or why this was an important thing for me. It's just, I've known for a very long time that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And so that's what I do with, with the podcast. The podcast is really a, a platform for me to share people's stories, whether you're a rock star like Jason Mraz or, you know, Susie or Jimmy backyard gardener. Right. It's, it's, it's designed to tell people's stories from the perspective of getting started in success and failures. Right. Which I think is so important to share the failures. I think people appreciate that more than anything about the fact that I show the, the flops, which are what push us to (laughs) succeed. Right. Right. So Greg, so when I first, I know that you just went through a big move and we're going to talk about that. 
So when I first met you, you were literally living in in an urban area and your yep. backyard was wall to wall. Um, and you shared the story with me, of course, I'm a flower grower, about how back when you first started selling vegetables and things, you all, I think it was in college, right? That you actually grew and sold flowers too. I did. And don't, don't, so I'm 61 years old and my college career started in 1981 at Arizona State University. I was there for one semester. I got two Ds and an F. <laughs> basically a 0.5 grade average. I absolutely hated it. I was self-employed back then. So yes, when I went back to college in 1999, one of the things I was doing was farming my front and backyard. And the urban farm where I lived for 32 and a half years is right in the middle of Phoenix. If you stood on the roof and looked 50 miles in every direction, there was city. So literally smack in the middle of Phoenix. It was a third of an acre. That's 80 feet wide and 160 feet deep. And I'd spent over 30 years creating it into an edible landscape. 80 wow. fruit trees, uh, plants that just came back year after year after year without having to replant them because I let things go to seed and then they would just come back. And uh, we had chickens in the backyard. Uh, over the years, I did aquaponics um, and you know, I experimented with a lot of things at the urban farm while I was there. And so the story you shared with me, tell us about your little, your run with selling flowers. Well, I, as I entered back into college at 39 years old, I looked at my yard and I was growing food basically for me and my family, my mom and dad and brother. And I thought, wow, I could actually make a little bit of extra money this week. Plus I had a really good friend that ran a restaurant. So I would get up early in the morning on Wednesday and harvest food and flowers. And I would take them to the farmer's market. And the coolest thing for me was that when I land at the farmer's market, the thing that went first was the flowers. Wow. There you go. Uh, gladiolas. Uh, gosh, what I, can't, it's been, that's been what, 20 over 20 years ago. I can't remember. I hear you. But, I hear you. So you were selling some flowers alongside your vegetables and that kind of helped give you some pocket money to get um, through college. Through college. Exactly. I'd make two or 300 bucks a week going to the farmer's market. And that's pretty good. So I yeah. want to hear more about the urban farm there that you had. I mean, tell us about how you, I know that people that are listening are like, oh my gosh, that's the size of my yard. Right. Um, kind of what was your, what was your, did you have a plan or did you just kind of start and build on it or kind of how did, did you also have annual classic vegetable gardens like tomatoes and those types of things or what did mm -hmm. you do? Yeah. So what occurred to me in the mid eighties, as I was playing with aquaculture, I visited a fish farm in Arizona and they were harvesting the fish and throwing away everything that was left over after they cleaned the fish, which is about 70% of the fish. And that made no sense to me whatsoever. So wow. on paper, I actually designed what we would now call as a regenerative farm, where everything on that farm gets used in some way or another, and it only produces a usable product for uh, either use on the farm or to eat. And in 1991, I had a flyer arrive in my mailbox on something called a permaculture design course. Permaculture, I like to call the art and science of working with nature. How do we work in the flow of nature rather than, you know, us human wow. beings like to work against nature. And for me, it was an epiphany and it went like this. Oh my gosh, there's actually something that I can call the way that I think. <laughs> because for me, I've always thought we throw away way too much stuff. Yeah. And so that really, and by that time, by 1991, I'd been living at the property that became the urban farm for two years. And I started putting in place essentially an edible landscaping. Uh, and a landscape that would reseed itself every year. One of my favorite things to grow is a fruit tree. 
And I, like I said, on a third of an acre, I had over 80 fruit trees growing when I left there Gracious. Two, two months ago. Yeah. Makes lots and lots of fruit. Uh, and, um, and that's really the strategy that I used using permaculture to get into uh, a landscape that you could just eat. And toward, you know, toward the time that I left, I, we left in April of 2022. So April of this year, we actually moved to North Carolina. And up till the time we left, it was a daily practice to go out and harvest something that was growing wild in my yard. That's pretty awesome. And you know what I just have to say, first off, you're like my dad, you, my dad was a water conserver, waste not um, mm -hmm. guy way back. I mean, when I was a little girl, um, the Mother Earth News or in the Earth Shelter, I think, magazine used to come uh -huh. to his house. And I mean, y'all were just so far ahead of everybody else. And it was the logic of just looking at the things that we're doing, not what everybody is supposed to be doing or thinking they should be doing. It's like, let's look at the basics, right? So you just right. remind me so much of my dad. Um, uh -huh. You know, and that's a good thing. That's a very, very I'll good thing. I'll take it. Yeah, my dad was an awesome, awesome man and so smart and um, my biggest fan. Um, I just wish he was here today to see all this success that we have had. And anyway, I all right. that. so you built up this amazing urban farm on your third of an acre lot. Mm -hmm. So how, I mean, I know that you have a heart like mine, that you're a teacher at heart. You want to oh, yes. help other people. Um, and that's what drives us to do all these crazy things. Everybody else looks at us like, are you really going to do something else now too? <laughs> like, when you're teaching people and you find an area that you're not reaching or that they don't understand, or they need it presented differently then you do it that way. Right. Right. So tell me, how did the podcast fit in? When did that happen? When did that start for you? Um, I'm actually going to go back a little bit further. Okay. When I went back to college, I, so remember I was 39 when I went back to college and uh, I got a bachelor's of interdisciplinary studies. And one of my classes that I took required me to create a vision for my life. And that vision, I looked at my life and it's, it was like, wow, I'm already doing what I want to do. So this is like 2001. And what I really do want to do next is step out and show it to people. So in 2001, I started showing my yard in tours. And there, I, I do it about eight Saturdays a year. And there were Saturdays that nobody would show up and I would put the tent away and, right. um, and then come back the next Saturday that was scheduled. I didn't do them in the dead of winter and the dead of summer. Uh, but in between, I would always show off the spring and fall and how beautiful it was. And over the course of 20, 20 years, um, it got to the point, the last tours that I did before we left, we had uh, five tours over the course of a weekend and over 300 people show up. And what they were, the, the landscape there was designed to showcase for people how they could do that them, do it themselves. Along the way, in 2005, I uh, decided I was going to do a TV show that I wanted to pitch to like HGTV on Living Green. So I went a Living Green direction in 2004, 2005, and I put together a team of people uh, we put together a grant proposal for Arizona State University, which I was still there. And we uh, filmed a TV show called Smart Spaces Inside and Out. Oh, that's a cool name. Yeah. And um, it was designed. And when I go back, it's on my YouTube channel for anybody that wants to look. When I go back and I look at it, it was such a freshman stab at doing a uh, my presentation, the, we hired a professional company. It, it was great. We went, to a, uh, we went to a film festival in LA with it. It was 14 minutes long. It never got picked up, uh, but it was a really amazing experience. And during that time, here's to your question. During that time, 
I was approached by a company called Farside Media in Phoenix to do a podcast. So my partner and I did our did a podcast. We had, I think, 48 episodes uh, that we did over the course of a year called Freshly Green. That's a good name, too. Yeah. So that was in 2005 and 2006 that we did the Freshly Green podcast. And so I got my feet wet in podcasting back then. And for anybody that's interested in the Freshly Green podcast, it's uh, part of my patron program. So if somebody signs up for the patron program, they can go back and listen to all those podcasts. And um, so that lasted like 48 episodes. So 2005, 2006, this was at the very beginning of podcasting. Right. And fast forward to 2014, I'm listening to John Lee Dumas, uh, uh, Entrepreneur on Fire podcast. Uh, and he's an amazing man. Uh, and he had this school for podcasting that he set up. I think it was convenient. Right. And it was like 1200 bucks. Uh, and so I said, all right, let's do it. And I had an intern from Arizona uh, State University that worked with me on the project. Uh, her name was Patton. And um, we put together per the directions in uh, Podcasters Paradise, we did exactly what they told us to do. That's exactly how I became a flower farmer. I followed her book to a T. Right. We're, we are rule followers, yeah. Greg. To yeah. a certain extent. Yes, yes. To a certain extent, yes. <laughs> um, especially when it comes to education. If somebody's got a, a model or a system that works, I'll right. pay them for it to learn how to, Exactly. Right. And I so mean, why we why reinvent the wheel? Cost exactly. you time and money, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So we did exactly what John Lee Dumas told us to do. He said record, I think he said record eight episodes, launch three all at once. This was in November of 2015. We launched three all at once and we were off to the races. Um since then, we have put out over 700 episodes of the Urban Farm Podcast. And to this day, we're still following his system. And one of the things that I learned when I was at uh, uh, the farmer's market that was a really important lesson for me in the podcast, and that is be consistent. Yep. Be there every week. What I noticed is when I missed a week at the farmer's market, my sales were down the following week. Yeah. People are counting on you to be there. So I use that same strategy with the podcast. And for the first two years, we actually put out three episodes a week. That is so awesome, Greg. And that's such a great tip because, you know, that's one of the things that um, I actually was posed this question last year. You know, I have a flower farm in school and we have a closed mm -hmm. group and I continue to mentor and I got a tagged and it was a question. It said, I do not have any flowers ready yet. And I mean, I can just not go to the market, right? And it's like, mm -hmm. sure, don't go to the market if you want to lose your customers. Mm -hmm. I mean, because this is what happens. We saw it happen over and over. If a vendor is there or a podcast mm -hmm. is launching new ones every single week and people get in the habit of coming to you, then all of a sudden, darn, they're not there. Guess what they do? They go and they look go for somebody, somebody else. else. That's and right. guess what? They may never come back. And that happens. That oh, yeah. really, really happens. And so I'm glad you said that. I, I believe consistency in business period is you. I mean, I don't, you just got to keep getting up and putting one foot in front of the other. Another, even if you don't exactly. feel like you're moving across a lot of ground. Yeah. And for not going to the market, this, this actually, this is really interesting. You should say that even if you don't have any flowers, go to the market. Oh yeah. And go sit, hang out I mean, with your people. I mean, you can, you make more friends that way. Take exactly. your dog, take your dog or a kid <laughs> and just sit in your tent at the front edge and greet everybody. And you better believe the people will stop. Yeah. yeah. No, Amen I agree. To that. So the urban farm podcast was mm -hmm. born. Yeah. Now I want to know, I want to hear all about, so for these 32 years, you've had this small lot a, a residential lot like residential some lot. people yep. had and you did all of this 
And I just want to keep saying that people, because I do, I feel like so many people, Greg, hold themselves back because they feel like they have circumstances. Let me yep. tell you, I could fill the list. <laughs> we all got circumstances. Right. You know, I mean, so the the thing of an entrepreneur is to take your circumstances and make the most out of them, right? right. I mean, yep. that's the smarty pants part of all of this. So I know that when you and I last did a podcast together, I think it was Succession Planting for veg with Vegetables Love Flowers. Yes. You told me then that you all were preparing to move to one of the most beautiful places I know of, because I used to travel there once a year for a spring conference to speak. Yeah. You're, it's, you're near, are you in or near Asheville, North Carolina? We are 10 miles west of Asheville, North Carolina, in mm. a little town called Alexander. That is, I mean, I loved going to Asheville. You know, I used to drive there when it was my sister and I were traveling and we'd set mm -hmm. up a booth. When I only started speaking, meaning I didn't have any stuff to carry, I would fly into that little Asheville airport yep. Yep. and flying in. Oh my gosh. I just want to say the pilot, can we circle four more times before we land? <laughs> right. It's just, it's very picturesque. It's very sweet. So tell us how that all happened, how you decided to leave Arizona move to North Carolina and tell us about this new space you have. And then you can impress them like you did me over what you've done in just days of being there. Oh, very good. Well, apparently it goes back farther than I remembered. <laughs> I have a couple of friends in Phoenix that I had told in 2008, 2009, that when my mom passed away, I was out of Phoenix. Now, I moved to Phoenix when I was six years old. That wow. was 1967. When we left there, I had spent 54 years in Phoenix. Wow. You know, we're the exact same age. By the Are way. we? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take it. It's a wonderful yeah, age. It is. And so I had told my editor and a friend of mine that when my mom passed away, I'd be moving. Totally forgot that. Because, <laughs> you know, that's like 12, 13, 14 years ago. And when I met my partner, Heidi, I had an opportunity to live for about six months in a ruralish area around Phoenix. We I actually moved out of the urban farm for a year, rented it to a friend and went and spent some time in a quieter place. And when I met Heidi, I said to her, I want to go someplace quiet. Because what I noticed was that it was a lot, a lot audibly a lot more quiet and energetically a lot more quiet out in that area. She told me, well, we can't because I'm a yoga teacher and all my yoga students are in Phoenix. So Heidi is the most amazing person I've ever met. She's my partner of a lifetime. I finally got to meet her nine years ago. And it was like, all right, great, no problem. I'm wherever you are, I am. And then COVID hit. Ugh. And on March 10th of 2020, yeah. she decided to put all of her yoga classes online, right? Yes, and, excellent. And she actually teaches more people online than she did in person. And she teaches them all over the world. She has customers in Europe and all over the US. And so about a year and a half ago, she came to me and she said, where do you want to live? And so we started this search of where we wanted to live. We wanted to go someplace quieter, someplace with more rain, you know, because in rain in Phoenix, we'd get seven inches of rain a year. Oh we were looking, right? Um, I was looking for a place that wasn't 4.7 million people yeah. living around me. So we went on this adventure. And in August of 2021, actually on August 7th, she and I put together a vision board of where we'd like to live. So at that point, we'd looked at about a half a dozen places throughout the US. We were committed to staying in the US because of time zones and uh, just ease of being right. able to deliver her classes and deliver my classes. And so August 7th, uh, we put together a vision board. And on December 6th, we found this place that we moved to. That's and so awesome. Six months to the day, we closed on it. So we closed on it on February 7th. Um, so in six months, basically, we created a vision, we found it, and we implemented it. And the reason I tell you that is 
because once one is committed, and I'm paraphrasing the Scottish Himalayan quote, once one is committed, all things of the universe align to push you in that direction and magic happens and magic happened. And awesome. Yeah. So you are quite a planned person. I'm pretty impressed by all that, by the way. Thank you. I don't, yeah. So you guys have just arrived. Welcome to the East Coast, the Mid-Atlantic. We're not on the coast, but you're more East Coast now than you were when you were in Arizona. Oh, big time. We're as far inland from uh, the coast on the East Coast as we were from the, on the West Coast. So Where are you really? Yeah. Well, welcome to this side of the United States. Since I'm in Southeastern Virginia, we're, I'm not a rock throw, but maybe, maybe for some rock throwers. A lot. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So, all right. So you guys have just moved in. Tell us about um, how much land you have and what you guys have. I mean, I was so impressed with the three things you've already gotten done. And what's your what's your picture? What are you doing? I mean, I know now you have a plan. What is it? <laughs> oh, there you go. First of all, what I encourage everybody to do in their planning and permaculture plan is to spend a year with your space. Spend a year observing your space before you make any major changes. Now I'm not talking about putting in a garden, go ahead, put in your gardens, you know, do rainwater harvesting structures. If you know, if you know where the rainwater comes from, but spend a year paying attention to your space. That's the number one thing I tell people because in permaculture, observation is number one. So spend time observing. And one of the things that I knew, we have a dog, her name is Kismet. She's a dingo, about 50 pounds. And very energetic at four and a half years old. And what I knew was that I needed a backyard for her. The property that we got is four acres. Uh, that's exponentially bigger, bigger than what I had in Phoenix. Oh, that's and, a perfect size. If you ask me, Greg, that's perfect. right. Yeah, exactly. And there's no fencing around it. You know, I, there's no way to keep the dog in. We actually saw a possum in the driveway and I had Kismet on lead and she went nuts wanting to go visit the possum. So fence was number one. So I actually pre-planned that one. In Phoenix, I had collected, you'll love this, uh, years ago when they did political signs during the political season, they would use the metal stakes that they would yes. pound into the ground. And I would go around after the election and collect the metal stakes that they couldn't get out of the ground. So they'd pound them in too far. I have a jack for that. So I would just jack them up out of the ground. So I spent, you know, I spent, who knows, 10 or five or 10 hours over the course of three or four years collecting metal stakes because I used them for the portable chicken coop in my backyard at the urban farm. So I brought 24 metal stakes and I found snow fencing. You know, that's that red slatted, uh, wood that's all yep. connected together with wire. Yes. Uh, and this is how this this is how this whole thing happened. Magic all the way. I couldn't find it. It had disappeared. Nobody had it because who has snow fencing in April and May? Right. right. I called Tractor Supply because they had it listed on their website. And the manager of Tractor Supply said, oh my gosh, you're not going to believe this. And I said, yeah, I bet I would believe it. She said, I had somebody order four rolls of it. That's 200 feet. And then they backed out on it. So I'm stuck with it. And I said, you're not stuck with it anymore. <laughs> I'm coming for it. Do not give it away. Uh, yeah. And so I pre-purchased awesome. it two weeks before we actually arrived. So the weekend we arrived, I, nailed, I uh, pounded in these uh, metal stakes and I put up 150 linear feet of snow fencing in the backyard. So I have an enclosed backyard. That was step number one. Step number two was try and figure out what to do with my compostables. I can't imagine throwing away something I can compost. So it's amazing I, the habits we get in, right? Right. And mm -hmm. so I found at one of the farmer's markets a interesting bag that is, it's two feet by two feet by three feet. And it's, it's like a funnel and you put food in on the top and the worms work their way up. And then you open the open the funnel at the bottom and you pour out worm castings after a while. So I bought one of those. <laughs> so thing number two was handled. This was all in the first week. 
And then there's this little patch out in our backyard that's probably eight by 12. And what well, they do the strangest thing here. They put down weed barrier on the dirt and then they put woody mulch on top of it. Yeah, that's, there's, let me just tell you this, Greg, there, that is a very common practice on the East Coast. I have met, I am an anti, it's called landscape fabric is what yes. we call it. Yeah. And I am so anti-landscape fabric, but there are actually contractors up here in Virginia and Maryland. Mm -hmm. That's all they do is remove that from people's yards. It gets oh, really? so engulfed with yep. perennial weeds. Homeowners can't get it out unless you tie your truck to it and rip yep. it out. Yep. So yeah, anyway, go ahead. Sorry. So I have this area in my backyard. I have this lawn in the backyard or the pasture in the backyard that I fenced. And I had this eight by 10 area that had this fabric underneath it. So I pulled it up and it had, you know, three inches of woody mulch on top. Now, what you may not know about me is I'm a huge proponent of putting down six or eight inches of woody mulch on dirt because mm -hmm. at the interface between the dirt and the woody mulch, it becomes the great habit. soil. Yeah. Amazing. So I end up pulling one layer of this uh, weed fabric up and then I get my pitchfork out there and I stick it in the ground and I, you know, I push it and there's another layer down there. Oh my gosh. They had put two layers, but here's the beautiful part. This is, this is what we do in permaculture. We take, lemons and we turn them into lemonade yeah. that woody mulch between the first layer and the second layer had awesome. turned into the most amazing soil yeah so thank you for whoever did that i ended up getting the second layer of of uh weed fabric up and then i just spread that soil that was in the between the wow. first and second, I just spread it in the bed. That's like the first step of making healthy soil. Add lots and lots and lots of organic matter. Yeah. So then I planted. Now, remember, I came from Phoenix. And in Phoenix, when you go to the nursery, if you're lucky, there's five different varieties of tomatoes. If you're lucky, there's five uh -oh. different varieties. Welcome to the East Coast. How many? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I went to the North Carolina plant sale urban plant sale. It was in this barn, the size of a football field. There was 60 vendors in there. I walked into a couple of booths that easily had 50, 50 different varieties of tomatoes. I'm just like blown away at the plant varieties. And so here's the question. How many did you purchase, sir? Yeah, well, I had to be careful about that because I could have purchased all 50. I actually purchased about five different varieties because that's all the pots and the ground I had available because I am notorious for buying plants that never get planted. And we all are. Right? We so I, put, I, I, I decided not to do that. So I made up this eight by eight foot area. I added organic matter. I bought some extra organic matter at the at the nursery and I added it and to start building the soil. And I planted five different varieties of tomatoes, a squash um, and uh, two different peppers and basil and cilantro, all in the first week of arriving here. You know, that's just so impressive. And I just wanna to say to you, one of my good friends, he was, I met him through going down there and speaking at those conferences, uh -huh. is right in the neck of the woods with you. It's called In Season Cut Flower Farm. And I thought of Ooh. him because he sells tomato transplants. Mm -hmm. In Season Cut Flower Farm. And it's Mark Smith and he'll be tickled. Um, I got to know him through the years of me going to Mother Earth News and speaking. Yep. And then mm -hmm. he became my student. And now he's gone from, he's added flowers to his vegetables and he's doing it. He's yeah. doing it. And so he would be, he's, he's a great guy. Anyway. I'll reach out to him. Uh, yeah. Um, so Greg, I mean, welcome to the East Thank Coast. Thank you. I'm, oh I'm my just, gosh. Wait until have... you know what I wanted to say, you know, the other thing, and of course you wouldn't really, you probably know this, but you haven't experienced it yet. The one thing that I recommend people do talking about permaculture and um, and you take it in your, your environment before you do anything. I highly recommend when we were talking about setting up in the, setting up your garden and building it section of school. I tell people, I said, when you're getting gully washers rain, you need to put your boots on and your coat on, and you need to go out and you need to watch how the water moves on your property. Absolutely. You do not want that water rushing across your garden. You need to nope. set your, I mean, 
I'm married to a man that that does is a plumber. So I mean, he's all about water drainage and storm right. drain. Yep. And I'm probably more attentive to this than most people. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you're going to be waiting until you see how much rain we get around this place. And oh, I'll, that's, that's going to be good. That's the other thing. I, I bought a rain gauge because there's this really cool website out there based out of the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. It's called rainlog.org. Uh, R-A-I-N-L-O-G dot org. It's a citizen science site. You can sign up for an account there. And basically, you just report your rainfall. That's awesome. So urban at the urban farm, I had um, seven, eight years of rainfall recorded there. And, you know, that gave me an idea over the years. Sure. Averages and that kind of stuff. So I'm really excited to get an account set up for here. That's really awesome. So now I want to hear more about, um, you know, how people, I know that you have a lot of stuff on your website too. Mm -hmm. I mean, people can see all your podcasts and I know you have courses and right classes. And so before you go in there though, what's the name of your wife's yoga classes? That's what I want to know. Ah, uh, yoga with Heidi. That's it. That's, that's the name. That's the website. Okay. Yeah. She right. actually doesn't have a website because she doesn't really need one. Yeah. She's, she's, she does yoga for boomers. And um, that's, she, yeah, that's us. Right. Yeah. And she's, uh, she was an extreme athlete when she was younger. And so she did a lot of damage to her body. And when she got into yoga 20 some years ago, uh, she realized that there was extreme yogas and then there was yoga is where you could actually take care of your body. And so she spent, uh, she spent a lot of time practicing and understanding how our body works as we age. And so a lot of her clients are 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. Um, I, so, I just found her on Instagram, yoga with Heidi, right? Yeah, that may not be her because I don't think she has an Instagram okay. account. So how would we find her? The reason the reason she doesn't do all of that is because she has a, you know, a pretty good following of students right. and she okay. just works with them. Okay. So, I Greg, totally understand. Actually, you know what? You can email her at Heidi at urbanfarm.org. She has her, her, her urban okay. farm email address. So I just know that my crowd is going to say, hey, what about that yoga thing he was talking about? Yeah. Oh, and so she does an amazing, it. she does an amazing job of us taking care of our bodies as we age. Yeah. So she does things like help people understand how to fall. You know, at 61 years old, there have been a couple of instances that I put myself in where I actually fell. Yeah. You That's know, great to know. That's get really off great balance. To know. Yeah. So she's really teaching people as we age how to take care of our bodies so that we age well. All right. So tell us about how people can connect with you. Tell us about your website or you on any social media platforms. How are people going to connect? Twitter, The Urban Farm, uh, The Urban Farm on Facebook and urbanfarm.org is our website. Uh, Urbanfarmpodcast.com is our website, but that it all goes basically back to urbanfarm.org. Right. It's a website that I actually purchased, I think in 96 or 97, seeing that, you know, there was a, there was a thing here and I'm, I'm a huge proponent of the most important thing we can be doing right now, period. In all caps is learning where our food comes from and how to grow our own, because we have a food system that has a three-day supply of food in any grocery store. And we saw it break down, including go figure toilet paper yeah. during COVID. And that was just the beginning of the problems that we're going to see with our food system as the years go by. I mean, and put aside the fact that it's just better for you, it tastes better, and it's exactly. good for you to grow your own stuff and get out there and do it, right? Exactly. And that's the bonuses because there's bacteria in the soil that has, that has you feel better. And the food that you grow organically is going to be healthier for you. I was just doing some research on something called lectins this morning. Lectins are what they call an anti-nutrient and lectins are in most food. And when you harvest food before it's ripe, 
the lectins are much higher. And as it ripens on the plant, the lectins decline and the nutritional value of that food increases. So when you're growing your own food and harvesting it at its peak of ripeness, it's better for you and it tastes better. I mean, how many, how many yeah. peaches or apricots have you bought have you bought at the store? And it's like, oh, that's awful. But for those of us that for a baseball instead of ex eating it. Exactly. <laughs> But when we grow our own and pick it at the peak of ripeness, it makes your toes tingle. Yeah. Right? It's so, so true. Yeah. Urbanfarm.org, you can find my podcast. We have about uh, set, we have eight courses that we offer on growing food, the basics, on backyard livestock, aquaponics. And these are paid for courses. Right. Every month we do a, uh, a free flower chat. In fact, you were on the flower chat recently with yeah. us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we do a, uh, uh, gardening, it was a gardening chat, not the flower chat. Uh, we were chatting about flowers. We talked about gardening. We have a seed saving chat that we do every month and a fruit tree chat, because my favorite thing to plant is a fruit tree because you plant it once and it makes food for decades. Right. And there's not much else to do. So that's pretty awesome, Greg. Thank you so much for taking time out of your, I know you're busy right now with getting your new home in order and getting your garden started. And um, it's just really exciting to hear about oh, it. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, and one of my favorite things about the podcast is I get to connect with people like you and I get to learn new stuff. You know, when, when we last chatted on our garden chat, you were talking, what, 20% of your garden should be flowers? Yes. Yeah, and, that's at least 20%. If you want flowers to impact your vegetable garden mm -hmm. positively, meaning inviting in pollinators and giving a place for people to eat, live, have babies and raise them, you have to have at least 20% of the space designated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because the pollinators are amazing. I had this, uh, I had this young lady come to my house in Phoenix before I left Phoenix. She was a college professor. And we wandered around my yard. And, you know, when you wander around your yard, things fly by, right? right. She knew what these little teeny bees were that were flying around. And she knew which ones were male and which ones were the females. It's addictive, Greg. It is. I mean, it is once you, I mean, people that get into bugs, oh, yeah. I mean, you can't hardly stop yourself. Yeah. You just can't hardly stop. I'm getting ready to do an interview with Jessica Walliser. Who oh, is she's that. amazing. Yes. And her new book. Well, it's not a new, it's a remake of an old book, Attracting Beneficials to Your yep. Garden. Yep. And it is really a, a farmer gardener book. It is about yes. how to do it. And yeah. I'm so, I'm so stoked. I can't hardly wait. Well, Greg, I think. Oh my gosh. Tell much. her. Yeah, absolutely. Tell her I said, hi. She was she's she was on my podcast recently with that book. So yes, yes, I will. She's also my editor. Um, ah. so she, she, yeah, she's pretty cool. Yeah. All right, friends. I'm gonna say sign off, Greg. Thank and you, thank um, you. yeah, thank you. And so, friends, if y'all are enjoying the Field and Garden podcast, please consider writing a review, sharing it with your friends. Every review makes a difference and I read each and every one of them. Um, you can always share from our website or from whatever app you listen. Um, and remember to head on over to thegardenersworkshop.com for endless adventures in farming and gardening and starting your own business. Till we meet again, friends. Ciao.